hands up and uh, bring them on in just a minute. So thanks for watching, everybody. Really appreciate this. Um, looking forward to having more of these industry of um, type shows in the future with some other friends. Uh, I mentioned Jim Catalano next week, but I've, I've got some other folks in mind that'll be joining me in the future. So hope you'll tune in for those as well. But today, this is going to be very special because these two guys are, uh, besides being, you know, fa fabulous, fabulous drummers, musicians, um, they're great old friends and they're hilarious together, especially. When I just texted Greg and Myron to say, you guys ready? Greg said, who is this? So he's obviously already deleted my phone number and uh, that didn't take long. All right, I'm going to bring the boys in. <clears throat> so. Here we go. Without further ado, please welcome Myron Grombacher and Greg Bissonette. And there they are. Johnny D. Greg Bissonette. How the heck are you, man? Myron making the grand entrance. I'm awesome, I'm back. Greg. <laughs> Where was I? Any mail while I was out. <laughs> Myron oh, Grumbacher and Vincent. Oh man, it's good to see you guys. I'm I'm Great so you, happy. John. Myron, I haven't seen you in person in a couple of years now. It has been, I think a NAM show or something three years ago, maybe. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. I, I, I didn't get any better thing. looking, but you know. <laughs> I you think weren't, you weren't expecting that, right? <laughs> Well, I don't want to disappoint anybody. Right. You're you're you've always been a good looking man and you're still a good looking man. <laughs> yeah. That's what right, Greg, am I right? You're still a good looking man. Baby. <laughs> Ooh, no way. You're the great David Garibaldi, Tower of Power. Yes, yeah, so great looking man. Yeah. So I got and a funky dude. And a, and a pretty funky guy. I get Myron, I gotta tell a funny story. I told this. When Greg and I were did our first, I think it was when we did our first show together a couple of last month, but, and I, I, I gave you a heads up that I was going to tell a funny story. Okay. The first time that I remember actually having a conversation with you, meeting you, you came into Simmons. I was so excited because it was the summer of 1985. I had just moved to LA. I was a huge fan of yours. I was just a, my, the band that I had, had just been in. We played a bunch of Pat Benatar songs I loved you then. I love you now as a, as the great drummer that you are. And so you came in to Simmons and you were so nice. And we were having this conversation and I said to you, Hey, Myron, you know, I sort of worked up the, the, the courage to ask you, Hey, Myron, um, cause invincible was on the radio at the time that summer is a big hit. What a great and song. I, what a great, great song. Drum I, great drum track, man. You can. And I said, Myron, what, what was the snare drum you used on Invincible? And you did the classic Myron. You went, uh, that'd be the Invincible snare. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. John Aldridge actually took that drum and engraved it for me. And he did a beautiful job. You know, amazing oh, cool. job. He put my Sacred Heart tattoo on it. And it says Invincible on it. And it's... All right. Yeah. And it was my legend. Yeah. It's Greg's friend is fond of saying yeah oh that's that's an awesome i didn't realize that and it yeah. was a it was a black beauty was that what it was or it was no a, it's actually no. a bronze snare that they made for me which was kind of like a prototype when they, they made me a couple black beauties and they made me a pounded bronze and a, and a solid bronze and it's a solid bronze i see okay yeah. and yeah. it's got the heavy duty ludwig hoops on it like the, the, die, the ludwig die cast hoops yeah big, can yeah. i tell my invincible drum story yeah, yeah, yeah. Myron loaned me that drum to play Eat Him and Smile. That's right. Oh, right, yeah. right, right. He loaned me the whole, he loaned me the whole uh, Japanese kit to play that album. And then the camo kit on Skyscraper, two David Lee Roth albums. Thank you, Myron. Anytime, Greg. <laughs> I still got the Japanese kit, but I can't remember what happened to the camo kit. Mm. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I did I some more around, records. I can't yeah. find it. You can't seem to find it. I can't. You can't. Uh, <laughs> well, those are some great sounding drums, man. Those were just yeah, they were some... great drums. They they still sound. Yeah. Can I tell the story about how I met Myron? 
Yeah, you got to. Yeah, come on. I'm, well, I'm handing Myron, it over to you, Greg. Well, no, Myron took me to meet you, Johnny, at Simmons in Calabasas. That's when I met you in 85. But right. I, I moved out to L.A., um, drove out. I'm from Detroit. Myron's from Youngstown, Ohio. I go to North Texas State to music school. I'm driving from North Texas State Denton to uh, L.A., and I have two cassettes in my car. One was Rick Springfield, Working Class Dog, and the other was Live From Earth, Pat Benatar, Live From Earth. Great live album with Myron just killing it. And I'm listening to him, him going, man, I'd, I'd love to meet that guy someday. Maybe maybe he lives in L.A., probably, probably does, New York, L.A. I'm driving over to uh, this area called Reseda and Sherman Way. Johnny, I know you know where that is. Yeah. But yeah. Myron's looking for a, a used guitar, maybe a telly or something. And I see him on the next block. I'm hitting pawn shops, basically. Pawn yeah. shops, yeah. 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 Right, right. It's all pawn shops on that corner. Yeah. Right. And so he's in the pawn shops, going from pawn shop to pawn. And I'm just, I was looking for a music store that I was looking, that I'd heard about where I could maybe teach drum lessons to try to pay the rent. And I see Myron walking across the street and I just completely stalk him, man. <laughs> I, I run up and he's like, I go, you're Myron Grombacher. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and luckily, I had played with Maynard Ferguson at that time. And I mentioned that name. And he goes, oh, so you're cool. Like, you're a professional. So you're OK. OK, right. Maynard. Okay. Yeah. And we became best pals right then, man. I got to finish the story. OK. okay. So we had, at that time, you know, you know, a lot of people, because of MTV, you couldn't go anywhere. So I picked Greg up. And, and he's what we would call a tail gunner. Because he would shadow me, you know, I was aware of him. And when I switched stores and I went into the other pawn shop and he followed me in, I knew eventually, uh, you know, he, uh, we're going to have this moment. So <laughs> the nicest guy on earth. And yeah. he goes to me, hey, uh, do you give drum lessons? And I go, no, you know, I'm not, I can't read music. I, I don't really do that. He goes, well, could we maybe just get together? I said, well, I'll, I'll tell you what. You tell me where you live. <laughs> and he was living with Bob Birch at this time. Right, great. Uh, I said, and I'll come by, you know, and you know, we'll we'll talk. Okay. So I get there and he's got a set of Yamahas, right? So I've never heard him play. And I go to him, okay. Um, he's asking me about some rock stuff. And I said, Well, sit down and play for me for a minute. And it was like, oh, my God, <laughs> it's oh, like, like yeah. 30 seconds yeah. into it. I went, oh, my God. OK, this guy's for real, you know, and then it it was and it goes to me. He's done. You know, you know, Greg is he's so sincere and enthusiastic. And he goes, well, what do you think? And I go, could have opened your hi-hats a little more. You know, that's right. That's about it. <laughs> you could you get some maple drums. Those Yamaha birch drums. Those are not rock drums. Yeah, and then you loaded me later your maple Ludwigs. Yeah. 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 But yeah, that's that's where we were hooked up for the first time. Yeah. And we played Love is a Battlefield, man. You go, you're doing a top 40 gig and you're playing that song. There's a lot of stuff in that song. I go, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to go. Yeah. And we jammed on Love is a Battlefield. I was in heaven. And Greg wrote it down. Of course. <laughs> I yeah, wish I could have read it. I mean, it just right away is going, like, is this right? I go, I'm sure that's right, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Looks right to me. You know? <laughs> and then I hate to monopolize the conversation. No, then no. <laughs> then uh, I guess Myron figured out I wasn't like this crazy stalker. So he invites me over to his home in Woodland Hills. And I meet the great Monica Grombacher, who not only makes me a meal that night, but probably is thinking, oh, here's this nice Midwest guy. She's from, you know, Pennsylvania and mine's from Ohio. I'm from Michigan. So they have me over like over 20 times for dinner and meet the family. I was there when they were starting their family with Kylie and Dylan and Gigi. And we spent like, you know, Christmas Eve's together. They took me in as the we guy that didn't know anybody in LA. And I felt like I was back home in the Midwest because what an amazing wife you've got, Myron. The, Monica. the greatest. Yeah. I'm the sure great. I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for my wife. So, <laughs> you know, shout out to her. Yeah, Monica. 24 yeah. 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 She is wonderful. And, and she's still the same amazing person that she's always been, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about to have this. that. 
you know, I've been lucky in life. You know, a lot of the things that I wanted to have happen in my career happened, you know, and the things that I wanted to happen in my family life happened. And, and my wife was the facilitator for all of that, really, because I had the time to, to explore my art because she was so adept at taking care of the children. She was a, a very strong woman. You know, I could go on the road. And, you know, she could not only hold the fort down, you know, she could, you know, take care of business on every level. So she's, uh, I've been blessed with her. Were you married, been married before now you? 40, 43 years. Wow. I was going to say 40, but 43. Wow. 43. Were I'm you married by the time you that, got that was like 43 minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, put it on. <laughs> but you guys were together before you uh, were with yeah. Matt Benatar too, right? Right. Yeah. Around when the dairy. Dairy. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, basically we would go on the road together. We were, you know, we were John and Yoko. We were, we went everywhere together, Man. you know, and then we, uh, you know, when we had Kylie, um, things changed a little bit, but Kylie was born at the right time because we were, you know, we had a private plane and everything then. So she would come on the road, you know, and it was, you know, the whole thing was just set up really well. And then yeah, later yeah. on, when they go to school, as Greg, I'm sure you found out, they do not want to go on the road. <laughs> right. It's like, I'm not going, you know, right. they dig in. They want to see their friends and, you know, have a real life. And uh, where did and you meet Monica? were able to balance that. Where did you and Monty meet? I was in Youngstown, Ohio, and she was from Newcastle, Pennsylvania. So that's like 10 miles apart, you know. She came and to it, a gig uh, or something? A gig in it, She came to one. Uh, yeah, the first band that I was in, there was a band called, well, not the first band, but the first band that did, did you know, a lot of gigging. It was a band called Freeport from Cleveland. That's the band I quit high school and joined. And to my parents, you know, yeah. were not ready for that moment. You know, <laughs> I tell you, that was, uh, you know, uh, that was, I was, was going to be, I was going to be a senior in high school and I just, I just took off. What kind of band was that? It was a rock band, you know, they were kind of, um, you know, we did mostly cover songs. There were three bands that did well, uh, Raspberries, uh, the James Gang, mm -hmm. and ah. this band, Freeport, you know, and those were that we would play like JB's, you know, the Raspberries were on Friday night and we were on Wednesday and the James Gang was every Thursday. It was one of those hip gigs. So we had those kind of gigs. So we got a lot of, you know, we got a lot of, uh, you know, we, we got to, you know, we got to tour a lot, you know, we opened yeah, up for everybody. Yep. So it was good. But you we never a, really had any deep success as a recording band, but uh, did yeah. well. Is that when you were playing a Rogers kit, Myron, a, like a white no, Rogers that, kit? That, that was my first drum set. Yeah. The first drum set I got, I, uh, we had five kids and we didn't have a lot of money. So I, I just, my cousin Jimmy had a drum set and I sat down at it and I thought, well, this is really cool. Cause, um, but then I didn't think much of it. And, and I was a singer, you know, trying to be a singer in, in bands and the drummer didn't show up. And I sat down and played drums, I was better than the drummer. So they go, you know, let's, let's kick him out and make five bucks a night more, you know? So <laughs> I had to get a drum set. So I drove a popsicle truck, a truck, which was a bicycle with the refrigerator on the front of it, up and down all these hills. And at the end of the summer, I had like, 250 bucks and my mother took half of it and and so i had you know 150 bucks and i found a set of rogers two wings and a biscuit two 12s and a 16 champagne pink sparkle and i put them in this little unfinished room which was going to be a bathroom you know so i couldn't get in the door once i put the drums in there so i would go in and out of the window so i oh pretty God. much uh, had three records that i kind of memorized i re i memorized the uh, the first Jimi Hendrix record, uh, the first Led Zeppelin record, and Desiree Ligiris by Cream. And I didn't know Ginger Baker had two bass drums, which actually helped me out later on in life, because, you know, uh, I, I just assumed that you could just do that with one foot or one foot yeah. in a four drum, which, you know, served me well for a lot. A so lot when, we do, when we do your next instructional DVD, it's going to be called, <laughs> I came in through the bathroom window. I did, right. Surrounded by a champagne... <laughs> Roger. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Myron, there's a picture of you playing that kit on Facebook and the Rogers um, owners group, or there's like a Rogers oh, wow. you know, I didn't know that. appreciation. Page. And there's a, 
Yeah, and 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 all these people were going, "Oh, Myron Grombacher, I love him," and and I yeah. I it made sense to me because of the the Ohio connection that you'd be playing right. Rogers, but I but I I never really thought to ask you about that. But that was it, and they were pretty. They were really plentiful. I mean, you didn't see a lot of Ludwig kits because they were expensive, you know, and and um, you could get a great secondhand kit of Rogers, you know, and the Swivelomatic that that foot pedal. Yeah. I love that thing. And I played it for years and years. I guess they're making it again. Yeah, Dale really Flanagan. Are. You guys know Dale Flanagan, right? Fortune drums from Cleveland. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love him. Uh, he, he was my roommate at one time when I lived in Cleveland and I was playing, uh, playing in Freeport. But uh, he used to rebuild those for me because I would break them immediately. You know, it was a leather strap and, and he was, yeah. you know, half, he would always be able to hook me up and take care of it, you know. But he told me they reintroduced the, uh, the foot pedal. So, the and Reliance, right, Johnny? We can talk yeah. a little bit about that. R I was Rogers just going to say, Rog yeah, Rogers is back under Reliance, which is also the parent company to Dixon. So it's kind of like both of those companies are, are have the benefit of this big company that's – and the new Rogers drums look amazing. They look yeah. oh, wow, fantastic. Great. Yeah, yeah they, they really always had great. a certain sound. I mean, they were really great for R&B, more than for rock, I have to say. I mean, they had a certain thing. Like you could pad that thing up and it had a certain sound to it, yeah. you know, but, you know, half the bands that I played in played funk music when it first started playing anyway, you know, so. Did you play with they the great Mick have. Mahan back there? I never did, man. Mick was always in like the funk horn bands. Yeah. You know, I was always in the rock bands, you yeah. know, so we would pass, you know, we'd play the same watering holes, but, you know, we didn't, we didn't play together. Well, the Until the better part of but you played on the same bill a lot with the James Gang with Joe Walsh. We didn't play on the same bill as as the James Gang. James Gang were um, what I used to go to a place uh, called the Gazebo Room in Youngstown, Ohio, when I was about fifteen years old, and I would sneak in. It was a bowling alley with uh, you know like a, a music room in the bottom of it, and I found out that if I went behind the bowling alley pins, actually <laughs> went under the pins, there was a set of stairs that led down. And I would sneak in and I weighed about 70 pounds and I was about four feet tall. So you had to be 18. So I would try to hide behind big people, you know, until they found me and then the bouncer would toss me out. But I would do it constantly. You know, I would get in every single time. And they'd oh, throw me out. Awesome. I'd come back again. And they couldn't figure out how I was getting in, but I was crawling underneath the actual bowling alley pins through this little narrow passageway and down these circular wrought iron steps and that put me into the gazebo room wow. so I, I have to hear the james I, gang wow. i just got to tell you really quickly Fog 49. Sorry, Fog 49 yeah there's so many great friends of ours and drummers watching right now this is amazing give us um, a few johnny give us a okay. few <laughs> jeremy stacy hey jeremy hey jeremy joe franco who has a joe question franco. Double joe franco. franco i'm gonna ask that question in a minute um i just saw Suzanne Morissette is watching. Hey, hello, Suzanne. And I, I also Dave Abrazes, Pearl Jam drummer. Oh my God, hey, Dave, is watching wow. from yeah. Dallas. That's right. Yeah, um, Texas, Dave, big it. fan, man. Steve Barney, Ashley Stone, all these great drummers are watching. Steve, so Steve Gorman said, I, "I hate that I can't stay. We'll check it out later." But Steve Gorman says, "Yeah, he he's oh, I love watching. that guy. Yeah, great. What a great drummer there." And, oh, they and less butts. Drummer. Yeah, and you guys all know Les Butts. He Les just Butts, me man. Hey, Les. Absolutely, man. That the new Rogers drums are being assembled by our friend Bill Dedimore, who Bill Dedimore, Woodland Bill Hills. Bill Dedimore. Uh, Governor Mayor of Woodland Hills. Yeah. He is. So, I still see him. I got to tell you a quick Bill Dedimore story. So I go, Myron, Bill Dedimore wants to go on a bike ride. And Myron goes, all right, where are we going to go? I go, I don't know. But I think, I think he's a pretty serious bike rider. And we all live within a square mile of each other. So Bill comes to my house. Myron and I got to get on these bikes. And we're cruising through Woodland Hills. And, and we Myron bought like knew, the day before. What's that? Oh, oh, Remember, we did not. I bought a bike to go on that ride, I think. I, did, I, really? I never rode a bike. Okay. <laughs> Well, you did really well. You had us full. So my Bill's in the front, Myron's behind him, and I'm holding up the rear. And Myron gives me this look like this guy is serious because Bill had a banana and his water bottle on the bike. He picks up the banana while we're riding towards Topanga Canyon. He unravels the banana, unpeels the banana, peels the banana, 
sticks half of it in his mouth, flips open a trash can. It's, it was trash day. Somebody's trash can was up. While the trash can lid goes, zinc, he throws the peel in, he goes, Cup, and he gets back on the bike, and Myron goes, this guy's serious. <laughs> <laughs> He wrote, for, we must have wrote a hundred miles. And then remember, we wound up like at that stone restaurant or something in, right. in the middle of nowhere. I right. didn't even know that existed. It was, yeah, it was crazy. Hey, Bill, King. we love you, Bill. Yeah. Bill did all the, all, all of the, the edges on my drums. Mine you know, too. Years, years, yeah. Years. yeah. yeah. I, I take them over to him and boom, you know, he'd make them sound better. So I, I, I have a picture in the next room that I think Bill's grandfather took or his father took from a helicopter in 1946 of our neighborhood in Woodland Hills, right where we were, where we are. And and Bill, I don't know if that was your grandpa or your dad, but maybe you can chime in. Good to, good to have you on, Bill. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good man. And Michael White says hello to you guys. Hey, hey Michael. Michael, Michael yeah. White, long time. I've got a lot yeah, of good guys cool. watching. So here's Joe Franco's question to you, Myron. So mm. he said, first time I saw Myron with Rick Derringer, he was amazing had this killer hardware like nothing I'd ever seen. Who made that rack? Yeah, there's that. there's a guy, David Lang, who, uh, uh, Morris Arnie Lang, who was the drummer oh, at the yeah. Philharmonic forever, and he's got an yeah. instructional video on Hudson, and who actually uh, now has the patent for Gladstone, because he was a good friend of Billy's, and somehow they worked that up. But his son, David, who tech for Buddy Rich, became my drum tech in Derringer. And so there was this, uh, and I, I'm trying to trying to remember the name of the metal sculptor that we got because I kept breaking everything. So I had the idea to make a cage, you know, where I could just mount everything to the ground, you know, and then it would always be in the same position and difficult to knock over. So we got together, and it was actually made out of cold rolled steel. So it was you could not break. I mean, I couldn't break it. Nobody could break it. But uh, yeah. and and I used it for years. Shown us. Uh, Jeff Shonis, you know, I'm sure everybody's yeah. aware of him. He was my tech after David Lang for years and years. And he actually adapted it to uh, whatever hardware I was playing. Well, for Ludwig, we, we, you know, we we redid some of the fixtures as Ludwig, you know, when we you did that. You invented the cage, Myron. Yeah. I, I don't say. think I invented it, but I, I came up with a pretty interesting concept with David Lang and with this other guy. I mean, it really was like the three of us brainstorming on it you know and uh and david's a very creative cap too you know well on mtv you, you popularized it on mtv you popularized it for yeah sure. i was gonna say you and know. it was before a lot of guys were using racks too i mean that had to be yeah i think i had the first one yeah <laughs> <laughs> but mine was like and it, it cost an ungodly amount of money when i was in derringer it was a ridiculous amount of money because this guy was an artist yeah and i had to bring welders in and you know it was like and there was like trial and error. So by this time, at the end of the day, you know, it was like probably seven grand back then. Back then. Oh, was, yeah, like yeah. 1976 or 75, you know. Yeah. Hey, Johnny, no. talking about that period of my room with Derringer, I don't want to run over you here. You're, this is your no, show. No. Can no, I ask no. a quick question of Myron, please? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Myron, would you please tell the world the story? And I've heard this from you a bunch of times we've been best pals for i years. may not want to tell all my stories right now <laughs> well how about just this one uh maybe maybe and maybe not <laughs> all right forget it i may have a reason why i don't all right okay. is rick derringer watching this right now is that why we gotta be, i don't know. We gotta be uh, I, I don't want to go there <laughs> It's got to do with, with, with Le, it has to do with, with rick derringer i gotta tell you you know it was like um and is how I wound up in the band is, is freaky too, because Stim Baders, who was the lead singer of Dead Boys, him and I were really close friends, you know, in Youngstown, Ohio. We're both from Youngstown. So then we both moved to Cleveland. Then he moves to New York City and lives, Hilly from CBGB's is his manager. So he, they're living above CBGB's. My brother, who was my sound man, I didn't have a gig at that time went to work with dead boys. He became their, their road manager. So Stim calls me on my parents' phone, which is a landline, and says, have Myron call me. So I call him and he said, hey, they're going to call you. Rick Derringer's people are going to call you. I, I said, why? He said, well, because he's looking for a drummer. I said, I, I don't think I want to play with Rick Derringer because we were into punk. At that point in time, my hair was red and spiky and flat in the air, you know, that kind of yeah. moment. That's what was going down, babe. And uh, so anyway, they call me 
you know, so they, my brother David comes back because I don't have a driver's license, comes back and, and drives me to New York City to, uh, to SIR on 54th Street. We get there about eight o'clock in the morning. I'm beating on the door, nothing. No one comes. So we go hang out in Times Square. Now in the 70s, in Times Square, unbelievable. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'm a hasty in a hurricane. I'm looking around going like, wow. We go back around noon, bang on the door. A guy comes out and he goes, I said, I'm here for the Derringer audition. He goes, they're not even going to get here until nine o'clock. I go, huh? <laughs> so I, you know, we were hanging out. Then I come back in. I don't know any of the songs. So there's five guys in the room, you know, and, and I'm the last guy. So I learned the songs while they were in there. So I come in, I start playing. And I thought I sounded pretty good. And then they cut me off. They leave. They, you know, they, and then they come back and say, well, you sounded okay, but we're tired. So we're going to put you up for the night. They put me up in Hojo's in Times Square. Times it's Square, like, yeah. seated, it's all junkies and hookers and like, you know, real, real <laughs> extra flavor section in New York. I come back the next day <laughs> and, and I do the audition and I want, I do wind up getting the gig. And, but they asked me, do you sing? I said, yeah, you know. And they said, do you write songs? I'd never written a song. I said, yeah, I write songs. So <laughs> when I come back, they go, well, play me your songs. And I actually had written two songs in the Hojos the night before, which were like, so I go to Rick, uh, can I play your guitar? He goes, I don't know. Can you play my guitar? I go, probably not. <laughs> you know? So he goes, get him a guitar. So I just drum the E string. And I start singing these two songs that wind up on the record, Attitude and Monomania. You know, and then they oh just start God. jumping in and playing with me. And then I was in the band, you know, so it was, it was pretty cool. How have yeah. I never heard that story before? That's unbelievable. I don't know. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize it. I wouldn't have, even have a career if Stim Baders hadn't told Rick Derringer that I was the greatest drummer in Youngstown, Ohio, and maybe the world. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are many here that would agree with that, Myron. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I, I had my when, moments. When Rick Derringer was on the Ringo tour, Greg, if you, I don't, I don't know what year that, or years that was, but you introduced me to him at one of the shows in Boston. And you said this, you know, I, and I knew your history with Rick and you, you made sure that I got to meet Rick and we, we were telling Myron stories. We were just you you know, we were. smiling his face. Yeah. yeah. And Greg well, actually talking. hooked me back up with Rick. I hadn't spoken to Rick. And he hadn't spoken to me since I left the band to join the Benatar band. And it wasn't a, a happy moment, you know. It was, you know, it's never good when, you know, you, you, you leave one gig and go to another gig. Yeah. So uh, you, probably, and, you probably don't want to talk about when you guys played on the same bill with another band that we love, right? Not right now. Okay, at another time. Right. That'll another be time. Myron part two. That'll be yeah. my report. Yeah, yeah. Enough about me. Let's talk about Greg for a little bit. <laughs> they let me off the seat. <laughs> let me stand up here. We're I've just, already done just... a couple of these with Johnny. We want to talk yeah. about you. All right, let's yeah, talk getting... about Mark Cranny. Okay, yeah. here we go. Yeah. Mark Cranny. Mark Cranny, our dear pal from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Jeff Feynman, look at that, man. Yeah. That was a benefit that Myra and I and the Woodland Hills Drum Club threw for Mark to get a new kidney because Mark needed a new kidney. And who was on that? Myra and Steve Smith, Vinnie Caliuta, Bozio, Ricky uh, Long, uh, Rudy, Rudy Richmond, uh, Carmine and Rudy, Vinnie. Rudy Richmond, remember Rudy? Rudy Richmond, who Long said, by the way, who shouted out to me to tell you guys, hey. Oh, cool. I keep Yeah, he's up in Canada too. freezing his butt off, but uh, yeah, poor guy. he had enough yeah. energy to raise a hand to wave, you know. So. <laughs> I was, justice. I, I was at that I was at that benefit that day. It was July of 87. Right. Guitar Center Hollywood parking lot. It was about 187 degrees, if you guys remember. Yeah. Yes. Sun. Really, really hot. Yeah. And it was like the who's who of drummers, yourselves included, of, of LA playing. And it was amazing. It was how about all those guys. Terry I mean, off? What's that? Tyra, Myron, how about when we cut Terry Bozio off? <laughs> We didn't know he was done, but Terry's never done. You know, that's the beauty of Terry. I mean, he can just, you know. Well, I remember know. he went on just before Vinny and I remember him saying, okay, I got to go. Vinny's, Vinny's coming on now or something. Is that what you mean? Like, did you? No, well, basically 
we were kind of emceeing the show and Myron was on if the If you mic. want to call it that, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> musically coordinating it. So Myron's on the mic and he's, he's about to talk and we're just, Terry had those Remo spokes and nobody had seen those and he's doing this thing and he comes down and he fades and he stops. We didn't know that there was going to be a big, big ending, right? So, so I walked behind him. Myron's on the mic. We're thinking, but Myron and I are going, yeah, he's done. So I go, so Terry, man, could you say a few words? And he goes, I'm not done yet. <laughs> and he goes, well, that was a few words. That's okay. And he got up and he was done. Oh, man. I felt like such an idiot. Oh, no, no, no. That was a hell of a day. You know, it Dave was. Weiderman, God bless him, you know. Yeah. Jeff Jonas, our stage manager. Jeff Jonas, yeah. yeah. I mean, and every single one of those guys, I mean, you know, and, and there were more, everybody that was there would have gladly played. I mean, the show of support from the drumming community was enormous. Yeah. Jeff Percaro right. came out. Jeff Percaro yeah. came out with his son. I said, you yeah. should play. He goes, I'm just here to listen. <clears throat> Steve Smith got us the journey stage. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Don Perry, I mean, everybody Don pitched Perry in, and it was an amazing, amazing result. Yeah. Carmine and his brother Vinny played, and Carmine said, "When Vinny and I play together, we're the world's greatest drummer." <laughs> That's right. Yeah, <laughs> I, and I correct me if I'm wrong. Vinny played this really cool lick or something, and Carmine stopped and goes, "I showed him that." <laughs> That's <laughs> correct. Yeah, like, yeah he's just <clears throat> yeah. having a little, you know, taking the piss out of himself. Like, yeah, I, I taught him that, you know. Yeah, I forgot yeah. about the the Apice Apice brothers. Yeah, yeah, they were they're still <laughs> slugging it out somewhere. Yeah, you know? I know, I know for sure. So Jonathan Myron, Moffat too, right? Or Ricky Lawson? John, Ricky. Jonathan Moffat. Yeah, Ricky. And, uh, yeah. yeah, Ricky Lawson, man. Yeah, man, it was amazing, it was an incredible day, incredible. Yeah, day. it was an incredible day. So yeah. back to Mark Cranny. That was because Myron and I and Mark and Don Perry started the Woodland Hills Drum Club in Mark's garage because he always had several sets in there to teach. And yeah. uh, we would go and jam in his garage. And he was kind of the grand poobar of the Woodland Hills Drum Club. Mark, the great Mark Cranny, man. Oh, man. He's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. amazing. I mean, he, yes. he's really, uh, you know, in terms of, of people that had a profound effect on me, not only musically, but uh, really emotionally. You know, the quality of his, he was one of the bravest people I ever knew, you know, and he was so unselfish and, and he wasn't afraid to live his life. Like a lot mm -hmm. of people, he had a lot of health issues. He had no issues. I mean, he, on his drum set, you sit down, no excuses. He would play his ass off. Yeah. Every yeah. time, you know, and he, he you could him. wake him out of a sound sleep. He'd stumble over to the drums and, and blow your mind. Absolutely. Yeah. And he introduced he, us to the great Dean Zimmer. Can we talk about Dean? Did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Talk about Dean. Yeah. He's our life coach, Dean. Yeah. We, we, we do this thing over here called Dino's Jukebox, and we bring Dean, and he's such an inspiration. If any of you watching want to get inspired by an amazing drummer, an amazing man, watch Drummer Wanted, Dean Zimmer, Z-I-M-M-E-R, on YouTube. Just YouTube Dean Zimmer, drummer wanted, and you will be so inspired. Dean was born with arthrogyposis, and he ties strings around his sticks so he can put his hands in. And when he gets out of his wheelchair and gets on the drum kit, which is an amazing feat in itself, it's like he was never in a wheelchair, and he's just playing and tiring us out. Right, Myron? That's right. And he knows every song. He knows yeah. every kill on every song, yeah. especially yeah. brother to brother. Mark stuff. brother to brother, he kills. Yeah, and and, oh, and cool. uh, the Deep Purple song with Ian pays the drum solo on it, and he knows the drum solo oh, note for note. The mule, yeah, yeah. The mule, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. God bless him. Is Man, he left-handed too? Is he, is he a lefty like Mark? Or no, he's a righty. He's, he's a righty. Right. Yeah. There's some great stuff with Myron and Dean. And Terry Bozio and I from Drum Channel, Don Lombardi has such a great archive of stuff. But uh, there's a great video on Drum Channel with Myron and Dean and Terry Bozio. It's so great. Because yeah, Don, we're all jammed. Don gave him a brand new kit. Yeah. That's the heart of Don Lombardi right there. I know, man. Don. Yeah. Yeah. Don Don's and John. Best. Two Don and John. Don and yeah. John. Both did. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And Chris. Yeah, we love those guys. 
questions I can throw at you guys. But in the meantime, oh, I want to mention, My- uh, Myron, I-, I sent you that that picture that my friend Carmina, the tattoo that she has. Right. Yeah. Yep. And she's she's watching right now. So I'm going <laughs> to see if I can do a little magic here and share that photo with everybody. I hope she won't mind. It's too late, Carmina. If you do mind, hey, I Carmina. apologize. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Carmina sent me this picture. This is a tattoo that she has of her hero, Myron Grombacher, which I think Pretty is flattering. so cool. Yeah. Wow. When I, Carmina, just so you know, when I texted this to Myron, he said, awesome ink. So. And I feel anyway. that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. Cool. I was just showing off that I, you know, proving that I could. Your technical technical prowess is is beyond belief. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you know, there we go. So, Martin, you, you, who knew? Who knew all those years ago that I'd turn into this technical whiz, (laughs) wizard, wizard, a true star? Uh, (laughs) Where we heard that before? Just a a a dumb kid that used to follow you guys around the valley, going. Johnny, if it wasn't for you, Myron and I would have never come up with our drum duet to play right. to play in Boston. And you put all that together, man. Wow, yeah, that was that was amazing, man. I so wish. Thank you for saying that, Greg. And you guys were. I just wish there was video, you know, somewhere. And maybe someday it'll show up. It'll magically. I know they were, yeah, they they were videotaping, but I don't know. I don't know if it was just a house doing it or what it was. Yeah. You know, but the anyway. Channel. The channel, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we 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 actually sat down for several days and we just came up with ideas. The first one, we wanted to do a powerful kind of double, you know, lick together. Uh, and then we left some space, and everyone in, in Boston went, "All right, all right." And then we do it again. And then we leave a little more space, like a fermata, like. All right, okay. And then we go into the thing. And and Myron's leaning back like he does. Yeah. Like that. People are just like, wow. It, it was kind of yeah. it was kind of that was a great one of the funny points of that is when we did the re- we did the sound check and then we left. Peter Erskine, Greg, who writes everything down on his floor, Tom Tom, right? He gets, yeah. He's got all of his little cues written. Peter comes over and starts to elaborate on it. <laughs> so he looks down and it's not what we, he had written. It's like, an, you know, uh, he got Erskineized right before we came out. To <laughs> we got it. Erskineized, baby. That's right. <laughs> who, else was on that? Was, who else was on that? It was you and I and Peter. Was Adam Anton? Anton Fig. An- Anton Fig. Adam Nussbaum. Yeah. Um, Jack Gavin, who was playing with Charlie Daniels at that yeah. time. Yeah. Really great, great drummer. Great yeah. drummer. Great guy, um, too. I'm trying to think, too. There might have been, there's a picture of it. I'll send you guys. There's a picture somewhere, but definitely Anton, you guys, Peter, Adam, Jack, maybe. Casey Shirell? Casey Shirell. Yes. Casey yeah. Shirell. Oh, that's Casey. right. Yeah. Casey, what a monster awesome drummer. Guy. He and Mark Cranny have a lot of history together. And man, does he have. Uh, a great book out. He he wrote the Berkeley School of Music drum set jazz book. Right. Casey is an amazing friend, an amazing drummer. Is, is the channel still there? No, it's it's been gone for a while now. Sadly, yeah, that was yeah, that was a you know a, a that was a great venue. institution. Yeah, a great venue. I mean, everybody played there, and it was a you know it's like a lot of places these places aren't there anymore, but. Um, but I'm glad I'm glad you guys were there because that was it was the perfect venue to have this too. It was, that, yeah, great. Tying that into Mark Cranny, we we used to do these jam nights at Mancini's, and one night Tony Williams and Colleen Williams, his, his wife, are in the front row, and you talk oh, about being intimidated. We're all up there playing, going, Tony Williams is in the front row. He didn't want to play; he just wanted to hang out because Colleen and Mark were friends from Sioux Falls, so we did our our Johnny D drum do it to Myron and I, and we brought it, Mark in and we did it as a trio. And oh, there is man. a video of that. If anybody YouTubes Mark Cranny, 
then you'll see a whole thing of him playing with Jethro Tull. And then it cuts to Mancini's and the three of us are playing. It's not the exact form, but it's pretty close to that form. And Mark just tore it up, didn't he, Myron? That was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, he never played. I mean, we didn't rehearse it. We just played it. So he was, yeah, yeah. I'm going to find that. Memory. Yeah. I have a great memory, but it's short. Mike, Mark, Mark, Mark had a great memory. He can remember all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, an old friend of mine, Derek Blevins, great drummer from here in Boston, played there a million times at the channel. He's just, he's, he played with John Butcher Axis. And I think you guys oh, might remember oh, wow. John Butcher. Yeah, yeah, I played with John Butcher. You did? Okay, yeah. yeah. Derek's a fabulous, fabulous drummer. Lives out on the West Coast now, but, um, but yeah, a lot of, lot of folks commenting about the channel. Um, but Myron, I want to go back just a second when, when Greg mentioned, or maybe, you, sorry, you mentioned MTV. And I'm glad you said that because I, I wanted to talk about that. I, I think of you, Pat Benatar, and you being one of the first bands, really, like in the MTV age, like what that, and what that must have been like that, that you guys, I mean, exploded on the scene at the same time this new medium started, you know, music television. Right. And what that must have it, been like. Cause it, it was, it was um, something none of us really saw come. Uh, we had, we had finished Crimes of Passion and we had a little bit of time, you know, a couple, uh, a couple weeks or so where we could just do whatever we wanted we decided to make a bunch of videos because we didn't want to go to Europe initially, you know? So we made yeah. the videos really to send to Europe, you know, and, and to space them out. So we heard about MTV. And then I remember that uh, Rick Newman, who was Patty's manager, brought a little black and white TV in because they told us they were going to play our video on it uh, when they launched the channel. And then they played um, video killed the radio star first. And then yeah. you better run was the second video that they ever played. Really? Yeah. The yeah. Second video. And then, yeah. And then because we had all these videos, what would happen is they would play, you know, three or four videos and they play another one of our videos because we had eight or 10 of them to give them, you know, so it just worked out that, you know, the album took off, you know, we sold like 7 million copies, like immediately pr due yeah. to MTV really more than anything else. Wow. What was the you second know, so, video? You better run was your first one they played. What was the second video you played? Uh, I want, I'm trying to think of which song it was. I think it was probably, um, I'd have to think back to it, but we gave up a bunch, you know, in, including some like live stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah. That, that was really, some of it was live and some of it was lip sync. Promises you know, the, in the Dark maybe? was that Yeah, Promises in the Dark, uh, but that was later because Crimes of Passion is really when that thing came up. But um, a bu we just a bunch of stuff from the first album and the second album that we did um and they just played it you know yeah. and, it and they sure didn't pay any royalties that's what i love about mtv guys <laughs> we're gonna take these videos don't worry you know there's no royalties or anything but we're not gonna have any commercials and yeah. that lasts about a year <laughs> right right yeah yeah how do they play music on mtv with and don't pay any royalties what a scam that is yeah but I I, i'll tell you though it it, it played to our benefit. It was Absolutely. like, we can keep the royalties because this amount of exposure that we were getting, you know, it was such a new thing. And the internet was not, you know, uh, yeah. the place to go at that point in time. I now with YouTube, you know, there, or, and TikTok, and there's a million different ways <clears throat> of going on that. But there's a lot of viable, viable outlets. Back then, MTV was, it was like radio and MTV, you know, yeah, and it was yeah. revolutionary at that time. As, as primitive as it seems now when you look back on it, it really was kind of an innovative idea, you know? Yeah. And sure helps out. Thank you. And the, the way you guys, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the way you guys, um, I mean, the way you seem to embrace it too, the way like you would, you would produce a video that was in sync with what the, what the theme of the song was yeah. about. Or sometimes, sometimes not. Yeah. Like, like, um, I mean, later on, you know, you, you get personal issues because uh, with their program, you know, because I thought that there was a lot of music that wasn't being represented. You know what I mean? And yeah. it took years to break that down, you know, till yo MTV raps and stuff, you know, uh, eventually they found a way to make it, you know, the what it should have been a multicultural experience the entire time. But, you know, we just happened to fit their 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 template at the at the original point of launching that that uh, that 
you know, service. So, yeah. 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 How about the Who's bands it? though? How about the young bands that if you don't do it on a video on MTV and spend a half a million buck, quarter of a million dollars, your record's not going to do anything. And then the label and the band spends a quarter of a million dollars and it gets played once and never gets played again. It's like, <laughs> wow. Yeah. I know. Well, it's just I know. like any other, anytime you have a, a, a restricted playlist, you know, like look at iHeartRadio, look at all those things. If you're on it, you are all over it. But if you're not, good luck getting there. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? And it's yep. the same as it ever was. You, you got to have the look of the Irish. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he saved Daddy's Day almost. Almost. Yes. Hey, and by the way, guys, I'm wearing this shirt, not only for our friend Stan at Pro Drum Shop, but to represent my LA buddy. So I'm, I'm, this is this shirt's for you guys. Thank you, Johnny. Shout out to Stan too. What a great guy that guy is, huh? Oh, Stan's yeah. And sometimes yeah, he tunes guy. in. Maybe I hope he's watching. You can see him. I'm representing. I'll send him the YouTube link so he. There you go. I'll never forget the Elvin Jones clinic they did. Now, Myron, I want to check with you. Am I allowed to tell the Myron Elvin Catalina story? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So my Myron and I go down to see Elvin Jones at Catalina. He had just done a clinic for pro drum at the musicians union. It was great. Yeah. Oh man. But, but no air conditioning, you know, again, in the summer, you know, 187 degrees as Johnny said, <laughs> and it was amazing. But the next night he played at Catalina's and my, uh, we didn't know this, but Elvin had a cold. And so I had met him once before and uh, I had said I was from Detroit. And I remember, you know, Myron's Midwest, he's Youngstown, Ohio, Elvin, Detroit. And I, and I don't think Elvin knew who David Lee Roth was. I don't think Elvin knew who Pat Benatar was or any of our, our, you know, the stuff we were doing. But I just said, Elvin, this is my great friend from Youngstown, Ohio, from Pat Benatar Band, Myron Grombacher. And Elvin takes his head and goes, wow, man, yeah, beautiful, ah, beautiful. Man. <laughs> Kisses him on the Kisses list. Me, right? <laughs> and what happened the next day, Myron? The worst cold I ever friggin had in my life oh. i'm usually pretty healthy it was like uh, <laughs> it was like the big one my head felt like it was going to explode it was great oh. remember, remember pico coming out and setting up elvin's drums Absolutely. which i had never seen before she's out there tuning the drums and she's tuning the bass drum and and the register that she's tuning the bass drum to Sounds like my 12 inch rack top. Yeah, <laughs> going, tuned up high. Yeah. This cannot be right. You know, there's got to be yeah. something wrong here. You know, <laughs> Elvin comes out, sits down, hits the, the bass, the bass drum, and it goes boom. <laughs> wow. I go, how did that happen? You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It drops three octaves just by the man, <laughs> the way he approaches his instrument. You go, yeah, by his mojo. So your yeah. sound is in your hands and in your feet. And that's, that's right. Rated. That's right. You know? yeah. And in your heart. Oh, that's and, and Les Butch just reminded me. I got to give it up to to Stan and Jerry at Pro Drum, not Jerry, Stan Stan, but yeah, Jerry Stan too. So Jerry, if you're watching, my humble apologies. But not Ben and Jerry. Quick, quick Stan funny Jerry. Elvin. Yeah. Uh, quick funny Elvin story. The first time I met Keiko in the early '90s, they were Elvin was playing at the Regatta Bar uh, here in Boston, and. and sure. uh, and he was playing Istanbul cymbals at the time. He left Zildjian to play, you know, the real Turkish handmade Istanbul cymbals. And so Colin Schofield and I went to the went to the gig and we got there early and Keiko was setting up his drums. <clears throat> so we being the gentleman that we are, we, we asked if we could help her. We like, you know, I mean, I mean, I sort of knew about Keiko and I knew that she took care of Elvin, but she was so funny. She was like, God bless her too. I, I, I think she's still with us too. She's, you know, maybe all of, five feet 60 pounds you know soaking wet but she's you know lifting up the, the cases and the hardware and setting the drums up but she, she, she it, the the end of the story is she she warmed up to us at first she kind of was like saying i don't know if elvin's going to want to see you he's resting and then she must have told him that we were there because about a half an hour later elvin comes down and comes over and we meet him we i'd never met him before and and uh and he was so nice and so kind and this would have been about 1993, maybe somewhere around that time. And I showed him pictures of my, my kids who were really little at the time. We were just having this really nice conversation. Fast forward, we, we go to the show, we say goodbye, go back a year later. I go back by myself. The first thing he says to me is, how are those babies? You know, like he, he remembered, yeah. he said, I, I hadn't spoken to him. 
I just said, I'm just here to just, I'm just, you know, I just wanted to say hello. And we, we had a nice conversation. It was another year after that, maybe two of just seeing him every year that he, he called, like, Keiko called me one day and said, Elvin's ready to come back to Zildjian, uh, which is, you know, just, it was a, a real big moment for me because it was such an honor, you know, to. No, uh, he's, he's a giant. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a, Elvin to me was like one of the, a, a, a really strong influence on me because of the way his emotional attachment to his instrument. You yeah. know what I mean? I, I felt that way about it. You know, when you saw him play, I mean, he was like a force of nature. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and and he could he could fill the room or he could just suck the air down. And he played the notes between the notes. You know, yeah. it was like yeah. way, the way he played, he stretched the time. He had the ability to he had this elastic quality to his playing. You know, That's that, it. that it, I, I haven't heard anyone since really be able to do that. I mean, you could you can mimic him, you know what I mean? But to actually, when you've seen him play and you see what he does with the time, the way he explores it, controls it, pulls it, you know, it's it's phenomenal, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he was a well big said, Myron. And you know, it's it's funny, I, and I never really, we've never talked about Elvin, I never really put that together, but it makes sense because when I first started getting to, getting into your playing, it reminded me of Mitch Mitchell. And and I grew. I ripped off a lot. I mean, I, that's one of the <laughs> <No>. first records. <laughs> I I well, there, you can tell. We, we, I mean, we if you listen heard. to the early couple albums, you go, okay. Well, he took that from Electric Ladyland. And then, <laughs> that's it's, isn't that off this really years? Oh yeah, uh, it is. <laughs> no, you. But I mean, you know, you you could see that there was. I mean, there was a connection there, and and right. and you could say that. I mean, Mitch rest his soul, be the first to tell you that he got everything from Elvin. I mean, he, you know, yes. he was such a massive Elvin and Tony, but but massive Elvin fan. So you can see there's that connection between all you guys, you know? And for kids out there that don't know a lot about Elvin, I mean, he was a personality too. He was a funny, oh, funny man. guy. And he, oh, would, right. he, he would hum and talk like this. And, you know, he'd tell these jokes. But if you want to see the funny side of Elvin, there's a movie that was done in 1971. And again, because of YouTube, kids go on YouTube and type in, Zachariah, yeah, D A C H A R I A H. Elvin Jones, he was a cowboy that took over the bandstand, shot some outlaws, and started playing Elvin Jones rock. Right. And I think it it looked like some of the James Gang guys might have been in the movie too. I'm not sure, but it was that yeah, kind of. Rock. I think Ginger was supposed to do that, and and wound right? up not doing it for some reason. You know, and, and and Elvin stepped in and did it. Am yeah. I allowed to wow. tell our ginger story? I got to clear all this with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you're you writing a you, book or something. I know you're old and out. No, I'm not. <laughs> you got to tell the ginger snare. I can't even story. write my name. You, you got to okay, tell so, it. You, so, so oh, tell I, the ginger story. I, 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 I get to meet a ginger, and uh, uh, we find out that he's going to do. Well, first of all, he comes to over to Sound City and he's doing a, a track in the next room and I'm doing my solo album with my brother and uh, we have this song and it's a double bass Billy Cobham. We all rip off everybody off. It's this Duke Duck Duke kind of a, a Billy Cobham quadrant four that Alex Van Halen will tell you yeah. he borrowed for a hop for teacher. So I'm doing Space this Duke Duck Duke 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 and I said, Ginger, come in the next room and I want to show you this thing and he listens for like 10 seconds and he goes, I don't play or like metal. And I'm thinking, this isn't metal. This is like Billy Cobb Fusion. So anyway, the next week, there's a party in Redondo Beach for one of those drum-off kind of things the Guitar Center was having. So Myron and Mark Cranny, Doan, a few of us went. Am I getting this wrong? Wasn't it his birthday? And it's you his gave birthday. A a Alan White from Yes called us. Remember? Thank you. He called me on the phone and said, Myron. It's Ginger's birthday, and we're gonna have a party. Can you round the lads up? And then you and I <laughs> called everybody. That's right. And we went. It was in Santa Monica at a disco. Remember the Red Onion. His his drums were set up on a plexiglass riser. That's right. And at twelve o'clock, he came out and did Toad. Basically, <laughs> remember and that. What did you give him as a gift? Okay. Well, on the way out the door. You know, I'm thinking, well, shit, Ginger Baker, we can't just, you know, show up at empty handed. So I, I had redone this uh, Radio King, and it was Tobacco Sunburst, 
with a main mic and system inside it. Beautiful, a- amazing wow. drum, beautiful drum. Yeah. So I grab it and, uh, you know, I head for the, for the door and I tell everybody, okay, we're going to give this, you know, we're going to give this to Ginger. And I said, oh, okay, great. So you know, uh, Alan brings me up and, you know, Ginger is affable and friendly as he always is. You know, there's a bunch of us. And he's just like looking us up and down, just like looking at us, right? I got a pretty strong look anyway, you know. So uh, at that point, oh, yeah. time, probably bright red, long hair, with leather jacket, torn jeans, you know, the 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 Ramones moment of my life, probably. But uh, we, I present him with the with the drum case, and and he looks at it, and he looks at me, and then he sets it down, then he opens it up. Then he looks, pulls it out and looks at it. He looks at me again, sets it down. Then he hugs me. <laughs> oh, it's like, boom, like, holy <laughs> shit. Then he loved all of us. You know, he was like the friendliest guy in the world. Oh, good. I'm so like glad. going into it, you know, yeah. you don't put your, it's like, you don't put your hand in the cage, you know, it's right. gonna, you're going to lose a finger, you know? So I'm so glad right. the story ended that way. And he didn't like throw it back at you, which I would have been shocked if he did that. Yeah, so. no, no, no. No, he liked the fact that it was a Radio King and it was a beautiful drum. Yeah. 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 And, what a great... and I think when he left town, I heard something about it hitting hitting eBay. You know, I don't know. I, I, I didn't get a chance <laughs> to bid on it, but I guess it was on and gone, you know? So, yeah. Whoever's got that one, enjoy. <laughs> you know? Maybe it'll find its way back to you, Myron. I, yeah, you I never just, know. I want, Greg, I want to tell you that Paul Dinage uh, sends his best to you. Oh, Paul Dinage. I have a nickname for Paul Dinage. He's one of my dear, dear pals of a long time. And when the first time I met him, I heard him say his name. And he said, I said, what's your name? And instead of, you know, Yankee Doodle, Paul, he said, Pooh, Pooh. And I said, what's your last name? And he's instead of Dinage, he said, Dinage, Dinage, Pool Dinage. So I call him Pool, Pool Drainage. (laughs) Pool Drainage is there. Paul Dinage. Can't wait to see you at the Freddie G Academy in the great uh, Winchester Cathedral campus down there uh, this August, man. Can't wait to see you. And Steve White and everybody, that's going to be fun. Uh, Steve White was on last week, in fact. I saw that. You did? Okay, yeah. We were, we were talking about uh, some, some funny Ginger Baker stories because he was he was there. We did this tribute for Ginger to Ginger in 2008, and Steve was one of the guys that paid tribute and he was steve was you know fantastic. gotta love steve so there's oh. one last ginger story that ties yeah, it i want to hear it yeah to boston and john de christopher so i'm going to okay. try to tie in myron john de christopher and ginger so <laughs> all right before the birthday thing um and i was getting to know ginger from this gal that i knew who he was dating her name was karen and they ended up getting karen. married so yeah. she invites me up for uh, i think it was a party for Kaufi. I don't know how to pronounce Kaufi. My son Kaufi's having a party. Yeah, yeah. So I drive up to like Vasquez Rocks, you know, if anybody knows LA. And I'm, I'm going on the, you know, the Antelope Valley Freeway. And then in the middle of nowhere, there's a home and polo ponies. <laughs> you know, yeah. And three drum sets set up under the stars. And you hear the polo ponies. <laughs> I said, wow, Ginger. He said, let's have a play with coffee. And so in the middle of our duet, Myron and I do this 6-8 uh, African groove where you take triplets and you do a round, like row, row, row your boat. The first one is downbeats. Dug it, 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 dug it. That's the row of row your boat. Then the next guy starts and 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 starts with dug it, dug it, while you move to the second triplet. Dug it, dug it, dug it, dug it. And then you do the round again, and the, the next guy starts playing. The, 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 the. So that all came from Ginger saying, all right, what we're going to do. And I learned <laughs> this when I lived in Africa. <laughs> well, I'm going to start with, tri- with triplets, with an F, with, with triplets. And then Calfee's going to come in and play that. And I want to skip to the other. You're going to come in with the downbeat, and then we're going to go, you know, around Robin. And it's. Myron and I worked on that for days. Days, and that's, yeah. That's what you heard in Boston there, Johnny. Oh, man. That's Pizza so. Boston. I did. Wow. Cream pie that we served up there. Yeah. yeah. Thanks to Ginger. <laughs> Boston cream, cream pie. Ginger. 
<laughs> Bada boom. You got a million of them, Myron. Bada boom. I do. <laughs> I want to, I got to tell you guys a quick, funny, this was a couple of weeks ago. Um, I guess when I had Rob Wallace on her last week, I told her. A quick Love Rob. Of, Hi, Rob. Yeah, he's probably watching today, but I just want a quick, funny Elvin story. Just talking about his, his personality, as you said, Myron is larger than life and, and Greg too. You said that, but he was, he was, it, there was this thing called the jazz awards. And this was, I want to say the summer of 1998 in New York city at like Lincoln center went down there and it was a, it was, I think the first and maybe only year they did these things. And it was a pretty big deal. And they were, Roy Haynes got recognized and Max Roach and actually had dinner with Max Roach before. And Elvin was there either to present an award or receive an award, but he goes up and it's in this big venue. And in the middle of him speaking, you know, and he, you know, he talks pretty quietly. He's talking like that. And he's, and this this alarm goes off this this like fire alarm bell like the ding 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 like someone opened a door so it's it's going off and everybody's kind of looking around the room thinking somebody's shut that off you know we can't hear elvin and it keeps going so finally it, it doesn't stop so elvin kind of just gets up on the mic and he goes uh dinner is served <laughs> <laughs> it, it brought the house down i mean it was like it was perfect you know it's like Oh man, that's there was great. So, great. Yeah, there was. I mean, that whole like your dad, Bud. You know what I mean? That whole generation. Not that we're not funny, but those guys were like, they were like a whole different breed of just the greatest oh, yeah. generation. Yeah, they absolutely were, man. It was just so thankful to to have been around while they were with us, you know, and and yeah. to know those guys. You betcha. <laughs> yeah, we were born at the right time. I mean, when we you absolutely- really think about it, the. Yeah. the- degree of a musicianship and the way music evolved and changed through our lifetime all the way up till now we've gotten to see some pretty amazing stuff i mean up close and personal you know which is yeah you know, yeah that's a blessing you know to be able yeah. to see tony williams sit down and play you know that's a life-changing experience <laughs> it sure is <laughs> i know i know so. especially where i mean you know you know god rest his soul it was just you know his it was he was here such a short amount of time that who knew when we got to see him all those years ago that it was going to be such precious time that we had right. you know it's it's uh yeah greg actually wanted doing doing some lessons with him right greg yeah i was up in san francisco doing a joe satriani record and i read bam magazine bay area magazine yeah. and on the last page in a little small rectangle it said tony williams now accepting private drum lesson students and i went you're gonna be kidding me so i called and left a message on his voice machine and uh he called back and said hey man uh, i'm all filled up with students but my wife colleen knows you through her friend mark craney Right. And she said you're That's a nice right. guy so you know what i'm gonna make space for you come up and i ended up studying with them for two years going to their house and taking lessons and and the next time i went up there on the satriani thing jay rubin and bud my dad drove a u-haul truck with seven drum kits because joe wanted all these different stylistic kits he wanted like a uh, a little bebop 18 inch kit we took the camo kit myron's camo kit i took yeah. like a hell blaine kind of dead kit with like no bottom heads really duct taped up and we used all these kits and i went over to tony's in my rental car i said man i have a, a little 18 inch bebop kit out in the car could we play some double drums and he he had his new dw yellow with red hardware drums he said oh we could just play on this and i pushed it a little further you know thinking eh, here we go <laughs> but i'd love to go out to my car and get the kit he goes all right go get it and i set it up and we played for about a half hour. I have a DAT. Uh, he let me record them on DAT or cassette. I can't remember. But anyway, afterwards, he he literally said, which killed me. He said, that was fun, man. I haven't done that since 1963 with Max Roach. Wow. He just wow. didn't really do that. And it wasn't. Yeah. Tony was kind of a personal guy. But when you got yeah. past that, you know, that, that little uh, curtain, he was an amazing, great guy. I, I, absolutely yeah he really was and and a really funny guy with a you know a really funny you know great sense of humor and then johnny um, you got me to do a clinic with him was it was it up at was it in northern california it was at lemon it? percussion it was at a theater and yeah, max yeah. roach was i think 
I think Max was going to do it, but then he couldn't. And then you got Steve Smith, but Steve had a vital information tour come up. So he actually said to you, I think, well, there's a friend of mine and he's a student and I'd like to have him do it. And you said, he's one of our endorsees. Let's do it. <laughs> so I go up there, Bud drives Bud and Phyllis with the Thomas brothers before there's an iPhone. They oh, drive up man. there in the Dodge van. They set everything up. And Scott Garrison was Tony's drum tech at the time. Yeah, and that's right. Scott, and Gar that's Scott right. says to my dad, hey, Tony told me to sabotage the drums and cut a hole in your batter head of the bass drum. And we're all laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Tony goes, hey, Greg, come here. I got to tell you something, man. He goes, don't be offended. I've heard you play before, but I'm going to go on first and you're going to go on. I said, I am not following Tony Williams. Louis Belson said, never follow a kid or a dog act. I say, never follow Tony Williams. Yeah. So he said, no, I'm playing. I'm getting the money. I'm getting to my limo and I'm getting back to my house in Pacifica. So I, after he plays this amazing thing, I play. But before I play, Will Kennedy had driven up from L.A. And he goes, hey, man, hey, great to see you. Hey, what time does Tony go on? I go, well, Tony already went on and he played and he split. Oh, <laughs> you man. Know, what? <laughs> I know. Who would have thought, right? Yeah, he, Tony did things his way, man. Yeah, yeah he did. Yeah. yeah, he absolutely did. Thank God. Yeah. I, I, yeah. You know, I, I'm fortunate and, and so honored to say that I, I – I traveled with Tony and Scott Garrison, who at that time was his drum tech on Tony's only clinic tour that he ever did. And I don't know if I ever told you guys this story. It was October yeah. of 96. He had just signed with DW maybe a year before that. And Don was really anxious to, to you know, book a clinic tour with him. So th that fall, we went out and we did two weeks on the road. And Greg, you know how that goes. But except with Tony, it, you know, it was a little bit different you know, we, we, you know, we flew first class, Tony flew first class and Tony insisted that I fly first class with him. He basically said, well, you know, you, you, you can't, you, he, I, I mean, he's, I hope Garrison doesn't take this the wrong way. He said, he said, Scott can, he can sit back there, but you should be up here with me. <laughs> so <laughs> who was, who was I to argue? <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's beside the point, but, but we, we traveled, you know, comfortably. And then like we had limousines picking us up everywhere and, and uh, but anyway, the, the point of it is that it was unbelievable to be with him, sitting with him, watching him play every night from like two feet away, three feet away. And, and he had this thing, Greg, where he would, you know, he, he'd play the drum solo. I'm sure you've seen it. And it would be that he'd open with that double stroke roll for like 10 minutes and just play the snare drum. Right. Can you picture it? Just that. It was a warm up, but it was musical. It, it was it, beautiful. It was yeah, exactly. It's yeah. exactly, it was a warm up, but it was beautiful. It was just this like, yeah, yeah. perfect, beautiful, yeah. clean. And, and then and, do the triplets. Um, you know what? Your, your mic is cutting out. It's it's weird. It's not. Uh, well, you do the triplets. Yeah. And then, he, yeah. and then he'd, he'd break off into like a. And so yeah. he'd do this incredible solo. And then he'd say, are there any questions? And. A couple of times, one time in particular in Memphis at Jim Pettit's shop, I remember this because it was it got a little tense in the room. He said, "Well, if there are no questions, then I'm I'm all done. So I'll I'll see you later." So he he said it again. Are there any questions? And I think people were afraid to ask a question. I'm going, somebody ask a question for crying out loud. So all it took was one person to do that and inappropriate the ice, and then it, it all went perfectly. Like you know, then ten more guys ask questions. I think got, got I, to love Memphis drums and Jim Pettit, man. Oh yeah, yeah. What a class I think, I think everybody was so sort of like just moved and almost like unable to do anything. You, you know what I mean? It was just his, his solo was just so unbelievable that you couldn't, you just had to sort of, you know, take it in. Absorb it. Yeah. Absorb it. Yeah. Yeah. So it took yeah. a minute to, what's, what's, see, what question do I have? Uh, I don't know. Like, there's so many, you know, it's like, it's yeah. like you're, you're trying to get all those ideas on that little narrow pipe of your, you know. Yeah. The one question I asked him first was, were you just super intimidated being 17 and playing with Miles? And his answer yeah. was so great. He just was truthful. He said, man, when you're 17, you don't care. It's not until you're in your 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s that you start thinking, oh, Myron Grombacher's here. John DeChristopher's here. Man, you know, I wonder what they'd like to hear. You start getting, you second guess yourself. He said, I was too young to even yeah. think about that. Miles would say, 
do some of that bugger, bugger, bugger stuff. I go, yeah. Sing, ding, 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 bugger, bugger, bugger. Take that and take this. Bugger, 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 bugger. <laughs> <laughs> <It was> just, <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. You know, and I, speaking of that, I, 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 until you said it, Myron, I remember a long time ago you telling me that you started off as a singer, but I'd forgotten that till you just said it today. So you started playing drums at a relatively later age than yeah. most kids probably, right? Yeah, I just kind of sat down and played. Um, but I think, you know, I think spiritually I was always a drummer. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I In fact, I, I remember sitting in the car with my parents, you know, listening to the music that they loved. And I was, pr I'm probably about seven years old and beyond the sea, which was a, like a big hit for Bobby oh, yeah. Darren, right yeah. here. And the drum track is amazing on it. And I remember when, when he does, he drops those two, you know, whatever they are, four bar breaks in as a transition. I remember reacting to it and going like, whoa, which was funny because when I saw the Beatles, I related to Lennon more than I related to Ringo. You know what I mean? I, I wasn't thinking of myself as a drummer. I mean, I love the Beatles, but it was John Lennon standing in the there with his legs, you know, spread apart in a badass attitude. That became the guy that I locked in on. You know what yeah. I mean? And then later on, you know, Ringo, you know, uh, absolutely one of my favorite drummers, and I think all of ours. Yeah. Anybody that's actually played the the instrument and had the chance to make a record and knew that they were recording a song that was a good song and wanted to serve that song you know had the attention to serve to play in the service of the song you considered Ringo you know yeah. I mean yeah. you know it's, uh, uh, what would you play you know somebody walks in and goes okay you know when I'm 64 I just wrote this song you go like I can't even imagine a look on my face if Spider would walk and say, okay, I got this song. You know what I mean? Yeah, you go, yeah. what am I going to play on that song? <laughs> and then he plays brushes. I yeah, know. and, and I know. right away, you know what I mean? Like without a moment's hesitation, I'm sure he just sat down and played and it was the perfect part. You know, he's he was so great on the Grammys the other night. Did you guys catch that? Him giving away here? Yeah. That, that was cool. Yeah, he's, well, he's a super cool guy. Yeah. Super cool. He's in love, Ringo. Yeah, right. he's in love, Ringo. Great interview on Colbert last night too, man. Oh, I didn't see that. I'll have that to check awesome. that out. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. They got the Grammys two nights ago and Colbert last night. Got like a He's half hour. <laughs> Oh man. Well, guys, this has been so great. I, I'm going to just see if there's any questions I can, I can throw at you guys real quick. We're around. Make We're some up if there are, John. I'll make some <laughs> up. Don't, me, don't leave me like Tony here. I got another one, but I don't know if I'm allowed to ask. You're not allowed to ask. <laughs> I want to just. You've been a asking for a lot. Before you tell tell this uh, story, Greg, I just want to. I'm not even going to ask. No, um, Eddie, Eddie De Frisine, I think that's how we pronounce it. Myron saw you a bunch of times with Pat. You blew me. You blew my mind at eighteen. My eighteen year old mind. You're playing your showmanship. You threw me a stick. It was like a baseball bat. <laughs> I hope I didn't hit you in the face with it, you know. <laughs> and he said, you'll be hearing from my lawyer. No, he didn't say that. Yeah, yeah. Statute of limitation. That's right. Way past that now. So, Way yeah. Past that. <laughs> no, that's cool. Okay. I'm going to just see that. There's been so many great comments. I just, I don't want to. Um, oh, I know. I wanted to tell both of you guys, Therese Demuzio, Therese Demuzio Lenny's daughter, is watching. And, oh, wow. Yeah. And she said, um, I do have photos. Nice to see everybody happy, healthy, and grooving. Okay, I'll get. I'll ask Therese to send me those photos, and I'll I'll get them to you guys. Oh, I'd love to see them. Yeah, love yeah. to see them. We loved your dad. Yeah. What a he great guy did. that guy was. We sure did, man. Yeah, absolutely. He was a, he was a character. I mean, uh, he of all the people that I met, and I've met some pretty been blessed to meet a lot of interesting people. Lenny's right up there. You know, ah, let's yeah. have a few pops, John. You know, <laughs> he was he was a tiger of a guy. The one mistake I made that I, I is I went out drinking with Lenny and Armin one night. Do you remember that, John? I think I was. And the I next day, I... I mean, I was so out of my league. You know, you know, I was, you know, I was under the table, and you know, and these guys are just getting going. You know, yeah, and the next yeah. day, I had I had to play, and my head was like coming off my shoulders. It was like, 
that, that was a lesson learned. You know, it, it, it was going to say it's a lesson when you hang with those guys. You you learn that you hang lesson with the them. first time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I yeah, remember Keith Richards is easier to hang with than those two guys. I mean, <laughs> I mean they they were the real deal. Jasmine, oh, you know, that's too funny. I remember all of us going out to. I don't know if Armin was there, but for sure Lenny was. We went to an Italian restaurant in the north end of Boston, the where all the Italian restaurants are. This is probably like almost thirty years ago, and and either Lenny or I got sauce on our shirt or something. And I remember you made a, you made a comment because you're married to an Italian woman. You said, right. Hey, it's, it's, you, you had this like philosophical, like, well, shit, man, it's, it's, it, there'd be something wrong if you didn't get sauce on your shirt. Like, exactly. Right. My yeah, wife like, gets sauce on every shirt she wears. When she has to be, that's <laughs> just how it is. You know? And she looks <laughs> great in it. So <laughs> she absolutely does. Absolutely. Yeah, she does. Yeah. Mark Petricelli is asking if you have any of those iconic drum sets. I think you said you'd still have the Japanese yeah. kit. Yeah, I still have the Japanese kit. You know, um, I've, I've got, I, I still probably, you know, I, I, I got rid of a lot of stuff to the Hard Rock Cafe years ago, but I still probably have 15 drum sets, 20 drum sets. You know, I, I, my DW stuff to me sounds so good that that's just what I play. You yeah. know, the other stuff, yeah. I mean, I... I love it. It has sentimental value for me. And I, I don't know what else to do with it. So I keep it, you know, so that's you know. great. Yeah. My son, Dylan, who's an amazing drummer, has absolutely no interest in playing the drums like that. You know what I mean? He's, you know, more of a uh, he's one up and one on the floor and it's going to be a standard size, you know. And he's like he's a vintage kind of guy. guy, too, right? Didn't you tell huh? me he was like. He's like a Gretsch round badge vintage. Oh, he's guy 100% too. that guy. Yeah, he got yeah. a set of, of the DW Jazz series in Walnut, and he pretty much that's all he plays. Yeah. Now, yep. yeah, but yeah, yeah, he ripped. I had a set of of uh, Green Moray um, uh, with the you know the four by fourteen Jazz Max Roach Jazz, and you know he's playing drums. He's been playing for about two years. I said, Dylan, come on, man, let's go get you your own drum set. I go, I got all these drums in it. And so I go in and I had them buried behind a bunch of stuff. You know what I mean? And he's looking at all these drums. And I'm going, oh, wait, how about these gold sparkle drums? You know, how about these tobacco sunburst drums? He goes, isn't there another set, like a green set someplace? I go, no. I, 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 no, Dad, I'm pretty sure you have like a green moray set, uh, like a Gretsch drums. I go, yeah. What, well, you sure those are the drums you want? <laughs> <laughs> Boom, gone. <laughs> so he played those until he got his DWs. But uh, yeah, I remember he's, that. he's in a great band called uh, Fox Trails and they just finished a new record. So, you know, when it's, you know, they, they play a lot during the summer. So hopefully they do festivals and stuff, you know. So That's hopefully great. there's uh, they can go out and play, you know, but uh, they have a website. A percussion too, doesn't he play a lot of hand percussion? Yeah, he's, he plays hand percussion. Uh, there's two drummers in the band. They're pretty cool. You know, so sometimes they're playing two kits. Sometimes oh. Dylan's playing the drum set and the other guy's doing loops. And sometimes the other guy's playing the drum set and, uh, and Dylan's playing hand percussion, you know? Yeah. So I got to tell everybody just, I mean, I, they know this already, how cool a dad you are, Myron, but I got to just tell everybody. So there's the no Ghostbusters. <laughs> Yes, the <laughs> Ghostbusters. So I'm going to say it was Dylan's third birthday, 1988, yeah. right? Something like that, yeah. Because my son was a year old at that time. We were living in L.A. And Myron invites me to his son Dylan's Ghostbusters party, which was the coolest thing in the world. You know, these, these it, you know, real life looking Ghostbusters pull up in the Ghostbuster car. <laughs> it was, it was so amazing. Like he got to zap the, the, the Pillsbury. The, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was an epic <laughs> birthday party. That was a good one. Yeah, that was epic. It was Greg. I think you were there. I don't think you were on the road at the time. I think I didn't make that one. I would remember oh. that. Yeah. You would remember the Ghostbusters. Yeah. 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 But he loved it. Yeah. That was, that was, I thought like, what, you know, I want, I want to be this cool a dad when, yeah. You know, I want to be able to do cool stuff like this. That was so fun. Yeah, yeah. I was more interested in being the best dad than being the best drummer. You know what I mean? I love, and I love the. I think we I all play, are. You know, yeah, yeah. that goes for all of we us. All sure. You know, we love important. being fathers. You know, <laughs> yeah. Greg and I have a very being a drummer. Bond. Yeah, Johnny, you and I, strong bond, same thing. You know. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. No, you and and you were a great inspiration too. When I would see you were coaching Dylan's 
uh, little league team, I think, right? Or T-ball team back then? Soccer. Soccer team. Okay. I'm Michael a soccer Keaton. guy. I'm a Liverpool yeah. football fan. Sorry, folks. <laughs> it's just how it is. <laughs> Only since 1979. So, you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. man. That's great. Yeah. Well, well, that guys, was wonderful I, to be able to have that, that kind of life where I could do, you know, those kinds of things, which to me, you know, were vital. You know, it was an important yeah. part of being who I wanted to be as a person and living the life that I wanted to live, you know, which was a balanced life. You know, success is, is, is fantastic and it, it's wonderful. But as you'll ask, most people that get there, once you're there, you go, okay, <laughs> do I do this again or do I do it a different way? Or, and, and, you know, some people like David Bowie are amazing because they can reinvent themselves. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and, uh, but most of us can't, you know, most of us are what we are, you know what I mean? And you'll have variations of it a little bit here, a little bit there, but, but um, there are blessed moments, but they are maybe looking back, there won't be the greatest moments of your life. The greatest moments of your life are with the people you love. And I love the people in the audience too, but I'm just saying, you know, yeah, keep it here. That's, that's beautiful. No, you're absolutely right. Sure. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yep. No. And, and, and you, and you've lived your life that way, you know, no I've doubt. tried to. Yeah. Yeah. Always yeah. with your family first. Yeah. Yep. Hey, I should mention old... Gigi, my daughter, too, singer songwriter, Gigi Grumbacher, who's had a bunch of success last year writing songs. So she's going to have an album coming out. She's got a new manager, so probably in the fall. You know, every, every he's got things in the can, but yeah. uh, but but she's done some really great writing for a lot of people. She had some success with some hits, you know, Europe especially. You know, great so. singer, great singer, great songwriter, great great woman. Yeah, she's beautiful. She's yeah, special. Yeah, That's fantastic. and I'm a grandfather now too, so I got to mention a little Kokomo. You can yeah. almost see in that picture over my shoulder. Hey! I can see. Who's yeah. also a Liverpool football fan? But <laughs> <laughs> uh, isn't being a grand a grandfather grandparent the best thing though? Like you it's just amazing. It's, 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 it's fantastic because you can just yeah. shake the soda can up and hand it back. You know, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's a spark plug too. She's up, you know. But yeah, I wonder where she gets that from. Yeah, I wonder. I don't know. I don't know. She's edgy. I said, I'm in there somewhere, you know, because my daughter Kylie is like, you know, the sweetest and always was, you know, and she's got a little bit of an edge, you know, she's a little bit like, Mwah. she's a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, like, well, Kylie's yeah. a lawyer. Yeah. yeah. That's what I've said. Yeah. 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 Isn't that oh, what you said? Cool. I meant the baby's got a little bit. Yeah. Oh, the baby's oh a yeah, I, know. Yeah. I thought you were saying Kylie was super sweet and, and mellow. Oh, she is. Yeah. Yeah. But she's a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> Let me restart that again. Yeah. No, my <laughs> daughter-in-law's a lawyer too, but she's sweet and, and wonderful and beautiful. So sometimes there's yeah. like actually nice lawyers out there. Who, yeah. No, I, I've always had, you know, I've always been able to find a great lawyer. You know, you just got to go through a few of them to get there. You know, <laughs> hopefully you don't this. need them on a constant and regular basis. <laughs> That's right. And I say this because our friend Paul Quinn is watching, who is a lawyer. Oh, so yeah. he'll, Paul. He'll that I'm, we're just winding you up, Paul. Yeah, the sessions. We're just winding up. And our old friend Jim Catalano is also watching. He says hello to oh, everybody. Wow. Jim. Shout out to Jim. Yeah. And I haven't Jim's seen him in a while. My guest next Wednesday. So that, okay. that's going to be awesome. Yeah. A great but, guy. Yeah, he is a great guy. What a, what a, what a history, you know, and, and a, like a, it's going to be great to just talk to him about the, the whole sort of history of the drum industry, Ludwig, everything, all the, yeah, all the stuff he's seen. So. Um, but guys, you know, I, I've, I've had you here for an hour and a half and Thank this you, Johnny. Amazing. what a blast. Amazing. It's, yeah. it's been we had a great time. Yeah. Man. An awesome time. Come out to All LA to and with us. I will be back. I will okay. be back. Cool. Um, right. I love you guys so much. Love you too, I mean, man. Love you too, yeah. man. This, is, this has been so much fun. Um, anything you guys want to say to, to the, to the folks? Stay strong. Yeah, man. Keep it real. Yeah. Keep learning, keep growing. And and as Mark and Brian would always say, be good humans. Yeah, that's right. There you go. All right. Well, you guys hang tight. I'm gonna end the stream and then I'll see you in the in the, in the dressing room in a minute. Yeah. All right. Thanks for in watching, the green everybody. Room. <laughs>
in the green room. Yeah. Hey, save me some some potato chips and and M and M's. No problems. I'll be right in there. All right. No problem. All the best. All right. See you guys on Saturday. Peter Erskine, 2 p.m. Eastern time, Saturday, the 20th. See you there. Thanks for watching. Big hand for Myron Grombacher, Greg Bissonette, two of my best. Donnie D. Donnie D. All right. Love you guys. Hang tight for one second.